احنا معرضين باي لحظه ممكن نموت من قذيفه او طيران النظام وقت عم يقذف الكارثه يا جماعه اذا دخل العمل الفيروس وكانت استجابتنا او التزامنا في القوانين ضعيف الى حد ما The latest offensive by the forces of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad on Idlib, the last rebel-held province in Syria, went on for three months. Entire cities were laid to waste and hundreds of thousands of people fled north for the Turkish border. Since March there has been a shaky ceasefire and life has been returning to the streets. But now there is a new deadly threat, the coronavirus. What is it like to live in the war-torn city of Idlib now at a time when the world is talking about one threat only, the coronavirus? We have been in touch with three residents of Idlib province. The student Saha Sator, Dr. Samir Kadur and Mohamed El Sheikh, who lives in a refugee camp. Over the last weeks they've been sharing their impressions, their concerns and pictures with us. We met Saha Sator in late February. Back then, fighting still raged in Idlib city, the provincial capital. Before the student arrived here, she spent almost two years in various prisons run by the Assad regime for taking part in a student demonstration. She says she was tortured and isolated in jail. <laughs> فأنا صابتني صدمة إني أنا ما أبكي يعني بضل بضحك فأي شيء بيصير أنا معي هلق أو من وقت اللي انسجنت لهلق بصير بضحك حتى إذا كان قصف أو ضرب أو حتى أشلاء قدامي فأنا بضحك هاي ردة فعل كتير بلاقيها قواسية بس ما بحسين وأنا أي شيء بضحكني يعني بدل ما يبكيني هو بضحكني Sometimes Saha works as a reporter for the Syrian opposition broadcaster Sai Plus Meanwhile she's studying business administration and has just been accepted into an online program at the American University of Beirut. When the ceasefire was announced at the beginning of March, Saha remained skeptical. I'm about here in the city of Idlib. People say that there is a lot of danger, but there is a fear from any moment. Because the system has no security. In any moment, he will kill a bomb, a bomb, or even a bomb. A brutal civil war has raged in Syria for the last nine years. Yet it was two foreign powers that broke at the ceasefire. On one side there's Russia, the Assad regime's most important ally. On the other there's Turkey, which supports the rebels, mainly made up of Islamist groups. The streets of Idlib city have come alive since the ceasefire took effect. The markets are well stocked again and people are out in droves. But just as the city's residents savor the taste of freedom, the threat of the coronavirus is looming. The first cases of COVID-19 have been confirmed in the capital Damascus. Sahar is worried. الناس ما عم تطلع ما عم بتفوت هون في ادلب الناس ابدا ما ملتزمه مثل ما احنا شايفين الناس بالاسواق طالعه ما في وقايه ابدا اخذين الموضوع كثير باستهتار نحن بنتمنى من الناس انه هي تلتزم ببيوتها ما تطلع على الشارع But there are almost a million refugees in the region with no home left to go to They are languishing in makeshift camps often in appalling conditions the 25-year-old Mohammed and his family fled to one of the camps after their house was destroyed in an airstrike. He and a group of like-minded volunteers built a small school here. He proudly sent us photos in early March, but the sense of achievement was short-lived. <laughs> وكيف بنتقل وكيف طرق الوقاية منه مثل ما بيقول درهم وقاية خير من قنطرة علاج نصحناهم بالضرورة النظافة الشخصية تعقيم اليدين والغسل اليدين بشكل مستمر. There is enough water in Muhammad's camp, but not in most others. Essential health measures, such as keeping a safe distance or washing hands, are impossible in many of the camps. 
said Mohammed as he sent us a photo of him wearing a mask. Having been through the traumas of displacement, death and destruction, some people just don't see the threat. Health workers are trying to raise the alarm in whatever way they can, face to face or via social media. Dr. Kadur is an anesthesiologist and general manager at one of the few hospitals still operating in Idlib province. He is trying to prepare the clinic as best he can, even though it only has two intensive care beds and a single ventilator. And there are only 95 ventilators for a whole region with a population of more than 3 million. Dr. Kadur says he's sure it will get worse than in Italy. Dr. Kadur says the international community is too preoccupied with itself for Syria to expect any help soon. He and his team are trying to do what they can. They have put off all non-vital surgeries. Other hospitals are disinfecting their lobbies regularly and taking the temperatures of new arrivals. Most important of all now would be to test as many people as possible for COVID-19. But it was not until the end of March that the World Health Organization sent the first test kits to Idlib. Now they've got 6,200 kits for over 3 million people. And even worse, there is only one lab capable of analyzing the results. The student Sahar doesn't know if the virus has long since arrived. All the same, she has stopped wearing a mask when she leaves the house. She says she can't stand being stared at and laughed at anymore. Now she exercises a different kind of caution. Schools and universities have been closed, but there are no official restrictions on movement yet. Nor has there been any sign of panic buying. All that could change if COVID-19 becomes part of daily life here too. We plan to stay in touch with Sahar, Dr. Kadur and Mohamed and update our Idlib diaries with their stories.